Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 48 of the In the 11 podcast, hosted by myself, Brendan Griffiths. This is the show where we bring on people from all over the football world to show you what it takes to truly be in the 11. And this week is no different. Another powerhouse guest in the 11, Steve Covino, is hopping on the mic for this episode. He shares his story of how he went from being a collegiate and youth coach in upstate New York to now being an academy coach for Atlanta United. And it is a story that you are not going to want to miss. So I encourage you to stick around. With that being said, we've had so many great guests in the past few episodes and some great people to share stories with. If you have an idea of somebody that would be perfect for the Indie 11 podcast, don't go do it now because I want to make sure that you listen to all the valuable stuff that Steve has to offer you in this next episode. But at the end, follow us over on Instagram at Indie11pod and comment on the post for this specific episode and who you'd like to see next or what content you would like to discuss and who would be a perfect fit for this show. So I'll remind you at the end, but just want you thinking about it as you listen to this episode a little bit. And without further ado, here's Steve. All right, everyone, we are joined in the 11 this week. Steve Covino is here to impart some wisdom on us, dedicated most of his life to the game of soccer in in multiple facets via playing and coaching. So I can't wait to dive into his story a little bit and and talk some footy with him. So Steve, thank you so much for uh, being on the show this week. Of course. Thanks for having me, Brenda. Happy to do it. Awesome. So uh, if we dive into it a little bit, we can start from, so you are a Siena College grad, originally from Connecticut, went to Siena and played your four years collegiately there. What was the desire to choose Siena? What was the desire to you know, play at the division one level. Talk to me about kind of your initial um, soccer career playing wise. Yeah, sure. So I grew up, uh, like you said, grew up in Bristol, Connecticut, uh, played for a small club uh, called Ajax Premier, um, who uh, Leszek Rona kind of uh, built that. And, um, you know, he is a huge influence on not just my playing career, but also a huge influence on my coaching career and you know coming into junior senior year of high school it was just like holy crap like what do I do where where am I going do I want to play division one do I want to play division two I was kind of all over the place I looked at a lot of schools Um, I had some interest from University of New Hampshire Merrimack College which is now at the time they were a very good division two school and now division one school as well Mm -hmm. Uh, Bryant um, you know University of Vermont a lot of those northeast schools that I went and visited or went to some ID sessions with. Uh, but Sienna, Sienna was co- always kind of under the radar. I was kind of using it as more of a backup school. And I went up there and saw the campus and loved upstate New York, um, loved the Albany area. And then, I mean, I'm, I know, I'm sure you know for yourself, it's a beautiful campus and uh, yep. really kind of, uh, you know, a smaller um, you know, landscape in terms of, you know, people and uh, the majority to, you know, the difference between, you know, having a, a larger classrooms and smaller classrooms. So uh, Sienna was just the uh, the perfect fit. And then, you know, merging the academics with athletics, you know, it was a smaller mid-major school, but it just kind of felt like home. So um, yeah, I went to, went to Sienna for four years and uh, loved every every second of it. It was a great part of my life. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Uh, so you felt like Sienna was probably the perfect fit for you in, in a lot of different ways. And how would you describe the, the overall playing career? You know, your four years on the field with the Sienna Saints, what would you kind of put that into words? Yeah, so it, it was kind of an interesting career. You know, I, I started uh, as a freshman. It was uh, under Charlie Curdo, who was the, the coach who uh, recruited me along with Matt Jones. Um, and learned a lot from, from both of them. Um, Charlie, you know, he ended up being my real estate agent after even after um, going to school at Siena and everything. So uh, still keep in touch with them. Great guy. Um, yeah. So, you know, freshman year was uh, was tough. We had a decent season and uh, losing, I think, in the quarterfinals to uh, Loyola, who went on to win it. Uh, and then sophomore year, we had Gareth Elliott come in and, you know, Gareth really was the guy who taught me a lot about, 
you know, different tactics in the game and, you know, a little bit more of, you know, how important the recruiting emphasis is uh, to college soccer. And played for Gareth for three years, ended up captaining the team my junior season. My senior year was probably my best year, I, uh, you know, as a consistent starter. I think I scored, scored eight goals, added some other assists, um, got second team all Mac. And uh, it was kind of, you know, from, from there, I was able to make the jump um, after a successful season to, to my steps after that in my cl- playing career. But Sienna was great. You know, some of my best friends I've made, uh, I've made going to, to school there. And it was just, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a great time on, on and off the field. So would you say that having the coaches that you did prior to college and then as well during your college career kind of you caught that bug a little bit for the coaching um, being around coaches that, you know, knew the game at a high level and were able to impart some of that wisdom onto you. Is that kind of maybe a little bit inspiration for you later on down the road? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, Leszek Ronoff was all through my youth career and I still use even some of the the sayings that he used to me as a coach. And I use that with my players. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Gareth Elliott was really big. Um, one of his biggest things was, you know, bend, but don't break. And that's something that I tell my team during, you know, some of those tough games as well. Um, Charlie Curdo was, you know, was really, you know, he, he had a different way of coaching. He was more of a motivator and somebody was very demanding. So it, it's really interesting because you take a lot of these, a uh, lot of different things from all the guys during your playing career. And it's, it's actually pretty funny now, you know, looking back and saying, wow, like these guys really influenced me a lot and how I coach kids and how I coach uh, young pros. So it's uh, it's really interesting when you think about it. Yeah, I always think that's fascinating is I've often heard coaches say, you know, the mark of a, of a good coach is, sure, you know, you can produce players that go on to play at the next level, whether it be collegiately or professionally. But sometimes the mark of a truly good coach that had an impact is how many of your players went on to then get into coaching later on down the road. So I think yeah. that's something interesting that obviously, you know, you are the perfect example of that kind of coming to fruition. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's crazy when you look at guys, um, you know, some of the guys like Gareth Elliott and even Cesar Markovich, uh, who was the coach after Gareth before, um, you know, before Gareth moved on to the University of Rhode Island. And, you know, you're looking at James Beeston, Matt Needham, um, Mike Matera, Nick Viaggio, you know, Joey Tavernisi, a, a lot of guys that came through Siena that, you know, soccer is still a big part of their mm-hmm. life. And uh, it's it's great to see that we're able to, you know, share that knowledge and then pass that knowledge down to uh, to younger players. So, Yeah, absolutely. So before you went full time into the coaching, we had after you had that senior season that you said kind of had some success, starting to make a little bit of noise for yourself. What was, you know, after you play that last game in a in a Saints uniform, what's the next kind of thinking in your head? You know, where where are we turning next? Yeah. So uh, interesting question, I guess it it was, um, you know, uh, the feeling right away is like, oh, I'm I'm, I'm kind of lost. Like, I don't know what is next. Um, I don't know if uh, I always knew I was going to, you know, keep coaching part of my life. I I started coaching when I was basically like 13 years old and I I knew it was my dad was a coach as well. So I knew it was going to be something I was going to keep, you know, in my back, back, back pocket in a way. And interesting enough, I was a, I was a history major at Siena. So, you know, spent a lot of money on this uh, education and don't really use any of it. So um, I'm sure my parents are, you know, pretty happy about that, but, um, but yeah, so after (laughs) after my last day at Siena, it was, you know, uh, last game, it was really, it was really tough. Not know really knowing what's next. Um, I had some communication with uh, some professional clubs that were interested, but nothing guaranteed. You know, I had, um, I always knew that I wanted to be a professional player and it you know, would be kind of like the icing, icing on the cake in terms of my career. I don't think I was, mm-hmm. well, I kind of know that obviously I wasn't uh, a really top, top player, um, but it was more of kind of, you know, I wanted to sign a professional contract because, uh, because I knew it would help me in my coaching career to at least see what it's like to, you know, have real life management be around you know, be around players that are not just playing to have fun, which what is was what I did all the time was because I really enjoyed it. 
But now when you're stepping into those mm-hmm. ranks, you know, you have guys who are, who are playing to feed their families. You have guys who are, you know, playing because it's all they had. And uh, when you step into that landscape, it's just like, uh, it's another world. So I was, uh, I was fortunate enough actually to, uh, to sign a professional contract with a club called FC New York which was um, located Mm -hmm. in Long Island out of Garden City. And um, yeah, it was uh, it was a great season. I was in the USL uh, USL championship and, you know, we weren't the greatest team, but uh, but it was definitely shaped a lot of, you know, my career uh, now as a coach. I want to ask you, because I think it's something that especially younger players now maybe don't quite fully fathom, like how much the landscape of professional soccer has really changed over the past, you know, even since the team that you said you've signed for, you know, obviously now it doesn't exist. The league yeah. at that time was kind of called something different. There was different branding, you know, even the the club that you coach for currently Atlanta United, you know, didn't exist up until what, six, mm-hmm. seven years ago, you know, and there's. MLS teams popping up, USL teams. Now there's a whole new league of NISA. Yeah. Can you speak to a little bit of how much like you coming out of college, trying to go professional is almost just like a completely different world to what it's like now? Yeah. I mean, really good question. I mean, back then it was, it was pretty difficult, I think, to, to go and be a pro. The scouting system wasn't what it's like today. Um, there's the, the, there weren't as many leagues. I mean, basically if you're coming out of a division one school, sometimes even a division two, uh, very rarely a division three school, you know, you would try your best to get into the MLS draft and, you know, only a certain players, I think out of all the players in our league, my senior year, there was only two players who are selected to go down to, you know, the, um, the combine and, and then basically try and get selected for uh, the, the draft. So it was, it was pretty rare. Mm-hmm. Um, from there, you have to kind of, you know, you have to either reach out to some school, to uh, some clubs and, you know, try and go to a open tryout, which was basically the pathway back then. And it's the pathway yeah. that, that, that I took, you know, I, um, I was identified uh, actually in Connecticut at a, uh, we were playing against CCSU and I was identified during that game. I had a um, an agent contact me afterwards and said, "Hey, this this coach was interested in you coming to a uh, to an open tryout." And you know, at the time, I was like, "Yeah, I want to be a pro. I want to I want to do it." And uh, so I ended up going mm-hmm. down to Long Island, um, meeting meeting some guys, and uh, you know, getting into this um, this tryout that was me and I think 250 other players. It was uh, it was crazy, but. Uh, <laughs> You see, wow. yeah, it was it was insane. But like back then, that was that was the route. That's what uh, that's what you had to do. There was probably, you know, if there's you know, if there's thousands of agents now now today in the U.S. at the time in 2000 was it 2010 2011 when I was coming out. There's probably you know far far fewer um, that were really kind of hitting the the North America landscape. So yeah, it was, uh, it was really tough. I don't know if that really kind of answered your, your question, but you know, nowadays, nowadays there's a lot more leagues. There's a lot more, you know, there's UPSL, there's a lot more agents, there's a lot more scouts. So I think it's, you know, a lot easier for, for guys to, uh, to kind of, um, turn into a professional career, um, here in the U S or possibly overseas. So. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think, Cause even that, that part that you just mentioned about going overseas, like now, you know, it's very, it's commonplace for Americans yeah. to go overseas. Like we see it all the time. There's always a new MLS player who's linked to, you know, this <laughs> club or that club, wherever in the world. But again, you know, just 10 years ago, that was not, that was not the case. Like there was, you know, you could count on one hand how many Americans were playing overseas. So it's just, it's something that fascinates me about how, different isn't and like you said it I do genuinely think it was probably tougher coming out of college because it was like you really just had to do it on your own you had to figure out a way to get into a team and oftentimes it meant going to an open trial where there's 250 guys they're all vying for the same thing that you are yeah exactly it's it's crazy crazy now thinking back at it but yeah it's definitely great yeah so having that experience in playing for FC New York at the time, were you also was this your first year coaching on the Sienna staff as well? Were you doing both at the same time, or 
No. So I actually, I left my senior year uh, at Siena. Um, the, the season for USL started, I think preseason started in February. So I actually had to leave a uh, semester early. So basically I left that, left, uh, I think it was two, yeah, it was 2010 and uh, didn't finish my year last year at Siena and, um, and went straight into, straight into playing. And that season ran, I think it was a little bit shorter than it is now. It ran from, let's say, February with March start all the way until I think it was August, you know, September area, somewhere in there where, you know, if you made it all the way to the championship or, or if not, it was probably ending like beginning of August. Okay. Yeah. So then basically so after, after that, first, oh, yeah, no. So, the, so then after that, it actually worked out perfect because by the end, obviously we weren't very good. So we didn't uh, make the playoffs or anything. So I was able to then go uh, back to Siena and finish my degree in the fall, which would then be, uh, yeah, it would be 2011. Um, and there, so it would be fall 2011, finish the, finish my, uh, finish my degree. And while I was finishing the degree, I was a volunteer assistant at uh at Siena uh under Gareth Elliott. Okay. And yeah. that kind of kicked off the next few years of you being on that staff as first as a volunteer and then as an assistant. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I'm curious because I know a lot of players, you know, every player eventually has to go through that that moment, right? Of when it's time to not necessarily hang up the boots because you never really <laughs> hang them up for real, yeah. but to, to hang up the more serious boots, I guess, so to speak, you know, you already mentioned it a little bit about, you always knew that you kind of wanted that experience as a player to help your coaching career that much more and develop you as a coach, seeing a level of that, you know, of that sort. What was that decision like for you though, to kind of say, all right, I'm ready to, you know, take this path a little bit. Yeah, to, to be honest, it, it wasn't that tough because, you know, I was always going into I was very I was very realistic with myself. You know, I knew that I, the, probably playing in the MLS was was a stretch for me and, you know, my capabilities. So, you know, it like you said, it was more of, you know, just trying to, you know, see what it's like in the professional environment to help my uh, to help my coaching career. But, you know, hanging up the boots wasn't wasn't as hard for me as I know it is you know, really difficult for pros that, you know, had five to 10 year to even 15 year careers. Um, for me, I just, you know, kind of looked at it as, yeah, like I was exciting to get into, I was really excited to get into coaching. And because I knew it was my passion is what I really wanted to do, even though I didn't really know which direction I was going to, to go with it. Um, but it, it wasn't, yeah, to, so in short, it wasn't that difficult for me to kind of, you know, like you said, hang, hang up the boots and, and move on to coaching. I was actually more, more excited for it. Well, I think, I think you should definitely be, feel at least appreciative of that. Cause I know for a lot of players, it's, it's a difficult decision. You know, yeah. I, I can share a story about, uh, James Beeston, who we were talking about before, you know, we hopped on the podcast. We both this summer uh, played for the NPSL team that was like, yeah. that was new to this area. The it's called the shockers. And mm -hmm. at one point he came to a training session and he was like, Oh, I was working on editing some, you know, some clip or some video for Bistera today. And I was working on it all day. And there was a point where I was like, I don't really know if I want to go to training. Like I'm so invested in this. I'm working on, you know, this piece of content or whatever. And he was like, and I asked him, I was like, did you ever imagine when you were, you know, 18, 19, 20 thinking, oh, I don't want to go train. I don't want to go play <laughs> soccer. I want to, you know, go and do this. Um, so what would you say? I mean, maybe I've just answered the question. and You've definitely already <laughs> answered the question. But like to a player that's maybe, you know, had maybe a few years in the game or not. How does it how does a player know when it's the right time? You know, because it's it's such a hard thing to say. All right, I'm done. Yeah, I mean it's it's a good question, but I I would I would say the you know the game the game basically tells you uh, in a way you know for me it was you know I did start some games in the in the USL um, I didn't start most of the games so I knew I was kind of one of those players I was on the edge and then when you look at you know the salaries for a USL player. It, 
there weren't any salaries, you know, you're getting paid like a really small yeah. amount of money, not, not even enough to live, you know? So uh, I guess kind of yeah. the game and life tells you like, Hey, this probably isn't for you. You know, you should probably, you know, find different ways to, to make money or find a different way to stay in the game. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's tough uh, at first, but, you know, my main telling point was, I ended the season with FC New York and then I, I tried to continue to play. I reached out to to some clubs. Um, I had an agent at the time who was who was also reaching out and trying to, you know, get me to go and play overseas. I knew it was something I wasn't really that interested in doing. But, you know, what told me that it was time to to really focus on coaching was I went to the USL Pro Combine, which was down at uh, IMG down in um, Sarasota, Florida. And basically, you know, same, same again, I was there with 80 other players, you know, they were, it was good to be selected to play in the combine, but, you know, once I didn't get picked up after that, after that, um, you know, had no contract offers after that, it was just basically like, okay, well, no problem. I guess I tried, I went down and tried, but you know, now mm. it's, uh, it's time to focus on coaching. And that focus, that, you know, now full force and full focus into coaching, I think is oftentimes something that players do because they think it's just, you know, the, the next natural step is if I'm not playing, then I'll coach. And I think mm -hmm. what you said was important is, you know, finding a way to stay in the game doesn't always necessarily have to be coaching. So what would you maybe say, you know, how does a player know that coaching is actually the way for them to stay in the game? Because I think... It, it it's has a lot of allure, but maybe it's not always the perfect fit for everyone. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, I was always passionate about uh, about coaching kids, and I was always, you know, really interested in, you know, how do you how do you develop a player to go to college? How do you develop a player to go to a prof professional youth academy? And then how do you develop that player to then go and choose? Do I go to college or I, do I become a pro? But so for me, it was very, it was very simple and um, an easy choice. But, you know, there's plenty of ways uh, nowadays for, for, for guys to, you know, after their playing career or even, you know, coming out of college, they don't, they don't go pro. Um, there's so many ways with either, you know, private coaching or scouting, or, you know, I have a lot of contacts mm -hmm. now who, who want to stay in the game and they've become agents. Um, because they've, you know, have a really good eye for talent and, you know, they, they want to continue to travel and be a part of it. Um, there's also, there's also plenty of, you know, marketing and social media jobs at a lot of those, a lot of these professional clubs. And um, there's, yeah, there's like endless, endless ways to, to continue to stay in, to stay in soccer. So um, it's great. And, and I, th I think it's something that 10 years ago, there weren't as many opportunities, but now, you know, any, any division one or, you know, any college collegiate athlete, uh, that's coming out, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, common for them to stay, to stay in, uh, in football. So, um, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. It kind of speaks to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago about when you were coming out of college trying to find that professional contract it was so difficult because the game just isn't in the same place that it is today you know as we've mentioned countless new MLS teams USL teams there's multiple levels of USL now there's a new <laughs> NISA league and, and college soccer is is maybe growing a little bit as well so the opportunity albeit maybe in coaching or elsewhere is just expanding every year it seems like definitely Definitely, hundred percent. I mean, there's so many leagues down here. There's leagues that that I don't even know about down here. Um, yeah. You know, in the south, there's um, there's a new league. Uh, I can't I can't even remember the name, but you know, the players are actually paid. It's actually very organized. Like there's live streams for every game. They have their own you know wow. their own uh, soccer ball that they that they use for all the matches. Like it's crazy. It's crazy nowadays. Every you know left and right, there's a there's a professional team popping up. So it's great to yeah. see. <laughs> yeah, it really seems that way. And it's definitely exciting for, for U.S. soccer. Definitely. Um, so now on the staff at Siena and having that experience, was your initial kind of thought like I want to become a head college coach or, you know, having that first experience, I think is often what a lot of players do that, especially that play collegiately is they, you know, are an assistant somewhere for a college staff. So 
what was that kind of stint like for you? And did you feel like that was where you were going to kind of progress your coaching career? Yeah. So um, it's really, really interesting because once I knew I wanted to focus on coaching, you know, the number one goal was always to become, you know, Siena College is head men's soccer coach. Like that, that was my goal. Mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, fully invested, you know, I was working for, I was working as a volunteer on the staff for, I think it was, it was at least three years, might've been even four years under two different uh, head coaches, uh, Gareth Elliott and then Cesar Markovich. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, yeah, it was always the number one goal to be a, a college head coach. And mainly because I didn't know that you, that you could be, it was, it was pretty, it's pretty crazy to think about now. I had no idea that you could be a professional youth soccer coach at the time. And, you know, down, down in the South and down, you know, closer to, uh, closer to Manhattan and Long Island, you know, they, they, they always had, you know, these directors of coaching, these, you know, these huge programs like Med Oval, Gachi, um, you know, PDA, all these, you know, massive youth clubs that had full-time employees, but in, in Connecticut and also in upstate New York, I had no idea they actually existed. So, um, you know, turning to kind of youth, youth soccer and, you know, at the same time looking for ways to, to, uh, to make a living, it was, it was tough. It was, it was difficult. Um, but yeah, the, the number one goal is always to be a, a college head coach. Interesting. Interesting. Do you have a, cause I've been in the same, in the same types of positions, whether it's volunteer or, you know, maybe you're <laughs> technically an assistant, but it's pretty much like, we'll yeah. give you like here, you know, here's uh, some pocket change for you. Yeah, Do you have exactly. any good stories? Cause I know like for me, um, at one point I was an assistant while also, you know, working a full-time day job and, you know, then going to coach youth Academy at night. So it was like, waking up 4 30 a.m to get to college practice in the morning then going to work then going to practice at night for the youth team like do you have any stories or, or any maybe they're fond memories maybe they're not so fond memories of that type of grind because in the beginning it really is a grind for a coach oh my gosh so it's it's funny brendan that you mentioned this um my life from as a volunteer assistant college coach um, as well as trying to make a living, you know, there was, I think it was during the off season. So anywhere from, you know, January to let's say March, April time period was the most hectic time in my life. And was the, um, you know, the, the grind, like, like you said, was, was real. Yep. Um, my daily Monday through Friday was basically looking, looking like this. Um, I would, I would wake up at, let's say four, four thirty in the morning. I would have to be at Siena for 6am practice, um, mm -hmm. have 6am, 6am to around seven thirty um, in the morning practice, hang out with the staff, do whatever we needed to do. Um, and then I would go, go home probably around 11, 12 o'clock, uh, mainly because I was, uh, I was a volunteer. So, you know, they couldn't really control all my hours and in, in the off season and everything like that. You know, go home for a couple hours and then, you know, my work day essentially would start at 3.30. I would do a private session from 3.30 to 4.30 with, I coached at the time with Alley Cats. So I was, um, you know, an Alley Cats mm -hmm. trainer. I was an Alley Cats coach. And I also worked behind the desk at Afrim Sports. So I would go 3.30 to 4.30, private wow. session. 4.30 to 5.45 was the first academy session. 5.40 five to seven o'clock was the second academy session you know they were paying me i think it was at the time it was sixty dollars to do the hour and 15 minute session so it was pretty you know pretty decent money um, that i relied on from mm. seven o'clock to eight fifteen, i would coach my team so i had two teams in, in the club uh one was a girls team that trained on tuesdays and thursdays the other one was a boys team from monday and wednesday uh, so from seven to eight fifteen, I would coach that session, and then at the end of it, uh, either at the Colony facility or at the Latham Dome over in uh, at Aframs, I would jump behind the desk and I would, you know, take take people's money and you know serve concession stand. I would, you know, every once in a while serve beer for, to the to the guys 
uh, behind yep. there for the adult <laughs> leagues at night. And uh, so basically from 8.15 until whenever I was released, which was usually around you know midnight or at the latest, one o'clock in the morning, uh, go home, sleep for a couple hours, wake up again at 5 a.m. and be at Siena for 6 a.m. for 6 a.m. training. So that was, you know, probably the most, <laughs> yeah, the most hectic, the craziest part about my life. But, you know, as a youth soccer coach, it's something that every every coach needs to go go through that grind, go through that that way of, you know, making a living while at the same time, you know, loving what you're loving what you're doing and. You know, for me, it was it was really tough, but it's definitely you know a huge you know a huge moment in my career that you know I don't I don't regret because I learned so much during uh, during that uh, those crazy few months and yeah that was the that was the the craziest part of my of my uh, coaching career slash trying to make a living <laughs> to survive so but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because sometimes those two things, you know, coaching career and trying to make a living, they they don't always necessarily sync up, you know, it, yeah. it's like, okay, I'm doing okay in one, but not so much in the other. I got to try yeah. and like figure out how to make this yep. work. But I'm so happy that we talk about this because I think yep. it's the perfect, you know, maybe PSA to coaches that are out there. Um, and I think there's probably two things that they should take away from what you've spoken about so far is, you know, one, if you think I really want to get into coaching, but you don't have the mindset that you did about like, I'm passionate about developing a player, right? How do I get player to get from this level to this level, you know, wherever it is they want to go with the game. I think that should be your motivation to want to be a coach. You know, it's not necessarily, I want to be in a coach because it's the next best thing. And I want my youth team to win every single, you know, state cups every year. Like that, that's not quite, I think where the, where your motivation should lie. And also it's, that that story that you just laid out, like that is really what it looks like for coaches in the beginning, you know, unless you have a illustrious playing career and, you know, you're Steven Gerrard. And as soon as you walk off the pitch, you know, you have people who are willing to offer you a first team gig. It's going to look like that. So if that's not something that you're ready to sign up for, that's OK. You know, I understand, but you have to kind of be prepared for it. Exactly. I completely agree. And I think every Every coach that, you know, didn't have a really big playing career, um, at least from all the guys I've met and, you know, other MLS academies, other, you know, full-time youth coaches, you know, they all had to go through something similar, something where, you know, they're doing private sessions in the field, in the, uh, you know, in the middle of nowhere, you know, trying to, you know, get that $50 or $75 or whatever it may be to, you know, to, to pay the bills. And, but it's, but it's interesting how, you know, that grind and everything really shapes us today and uh, really kind of, yeah. you know, even during, during those, uh, those uh, private sessions, like you have to be really focused on technique and it really teaches you technique. And if you're, if you're not able to teach that technique, then, you know, you have to have, um, you know, different avenues or different technology um, it might be, or, you know, different ways to kind of get your point across to these players. And I think you only learn that through, you know, gr going through that, uh, you know, kind of washing machine in a way of, uh, in a, uh, a way of coaching. So. Yeah, absolutely. And that holistic coaching experience that you had in that coaching education of college, youth, private training, you know, eventually it's all led to now you're in a position where you're an Atlanta United Academy coach. So I know I'm sure there's a million dots in between going from that first <laughs> time when you were the Siena volunteer assistant to now, but kind of how did, you know, how did this opportunity come about? Because as someone from looking from the outside in, it's like, wow, this guy from upstate New York is now the Academy coach for Atlanta United. <laughs> so maybe help the listener a little bit show how we got from, from one to the other. Yeah, for sure. So I'll try and keep the I'll try and keep the story as um, as, as kind of brief as, as possible. But uh, basically, you know, uh, Doug Lamoff, I'm not I'm not sure if you you've ever heard of him. Uh, Doug Lamoff is yep. my mentor and, you know, my my friend and, um, you know, is uh, probably the number one person who I owe my career to. Um, he's probably the smartest guy, I've, well, easily the smartest guy I've ever met. And, um, you know, he is, is somebody who really shaped me as a coach and really, you know, shaped my career. And basically what, what happened was when I started coaching at Alley Cats at U13, I ended up coaching his son. 
and you know I coached his son for three years and didn't really know who he was or you know what he was basically uh, involved with until probably my second year uh, of coaching uh, his son Caden and um, basically you know I, I started to to work with him and you know he he really value, valued me as a you know as a educator to his son and trying to you know grow the love and uh, for the game and stuff with with Caden. And, you know, we, we came together, we had, you know, multiple meetings about, you know, how do we kind of push the team forward, but also, you know, how do we educate the players that, that we have and, uh, you know, kind of grow their, you know, technique and career and game understanding and all that stuff. So um, basically Doug and I, Doug was working with you at the U S soccer Federation for a while uh, under uh, you know, working really closely with Dave Chesler, who, you know, Dave was the, um, probably the number one guy at the time who was coaching coaches. And, you know, Doug is a, uh, a huge influencer in, you know, making teachers better and making, you know, school teachers better. And then kind of connecting, uh, connecting the uh, teaching to coaching and how they're basically, you know, we're, we're all educators and we're all uh, intertwined. So, um, Doug, you know, was doing really well in, you know, these uh, U.S. soccer, um, either academy directors courses, pro licenses, um, other coaching licenses. And, you know, basically Doug and I, Doug was tasked with working on the F license. And he asked me if I wanted to kind of join and, you know, be the coach in, in the videos. And, you know, uh, at the time it was a online course, so it kind of reached a, a good amount of people. And so we worked with the, we worked on the F license together and we did a taping of it. And one, I think it was one December, Doug was uh, invited down to, he was in down, invited down to Florida to do the Academy Directors course that was going on. And basically how it ended up going was, you know, here's, here's a video of Steve coaching and he's presenting to you know, the, the director at Castle, the director at DC United, Sporting Kansas City, uh, Gachi, Beachside, all these, all these big clubs. Uh, PDA was there. Um, so it was a good mix of MLS clubs and a good mix of, you know, top, top youth clubs in throughout the entire country. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, we go down there. Um, he invites me down and, you know, Doug is showing videos of me coaching. And it was basically like, oh, if you have any questions like Steve is actually here. See, he's in the back of the room. Um, if you want it to, you know, run anything by him or, or whatever. So, um, it was kind of crazy at the, at the next break. Um, the, I had all these directors kind of coming up to me and, you know, introducing themselves, handing me their cards and, you know, Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon. We'll, we'll talk soon. All, all this stuff. And I was just completely overwhelmed because wasn't expecting it at, at all. I was just expecting to go down there and learn. And, you know, after yeah. that trip, um, after that trip, basically, you know, coming back to coming back to Albany and, you know, just kind of digesting the whole thing. It just really made me realize that um, I wanted to I wanted to coach kids. I wanted I was passionate about coaching kids and developing the player from a young age instead of, you know, taking this player who you know, is in college already and trying to you know get him to where he wants to be. It was kind of the 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 change in my career that I finally realized, Hey, I want to be a youth soccer coach. So how, how am I going to do this? And because I had no idea, I had no idea about anything about, you know, youth soccer developing, um, building out of the back or, you know, different phases of the game, all these, all these things that were very distant to me. Um, so I basically decided that I needed to, I need to, um, you know, take one of these job offers and, um, I was very fortunate. They came in from, you know, Atlanta United, where I ended up, but also um, NCFC, which at the time was the Carolina Railhawks, uh, DC United, Sporting Kansas mm -hmm. City. You know, these guys were basically saw my coaching and, you know, saw value in how I was teaching these kids and they, you know, needed it in their program. So, um yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of the the story. And sorry, I wasn't as brief as I, I as I wanted to be, but um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's kind of crazy how it all happened. And you know, when I, when I came back to when I came back to New York, I met with uh, Afram Nezai, who I you know I still I'm sure you know, um, and I still keep in touch with yep. him. He was 
you know, great. And in, in my coaching career too, he allowed me to, you know, coach the, the way I wanted to coach, but also, you know, he was my, he was my boss and um, he was trying to grow the club. And, you know, when I came back and, you know, told him, Hey, I have all these job offers. Like I want to say in Albany, I was really passionate about, you know, the city and, uh, uh, and the club that I was working at. And he worked with me and um, he ended up promoting me to, uh, I guess at the time it was technical director uh, of the Alley Cats and, mm -hmm. you know, we're working on different projects and, you know, trying to, you know, align, you know, New York Elite and Blackwatch and, you know, all this stuff. And now, you know, I'm really happy to see that Alley Cats in New York Elite have a have some type of uh, relationship on the boys side, which I think yep. is great. Um but, you know, what from that promotion and, you know, it was great. It was more money. It was uh, it was everything. But I still did not understand, you know, I needed to leave to to kind of find out, you know, what does it take to coach an elite player? And, you know, how can I um, because when I took the technical director's job, I was, you know, I was in charge of everything. I was in charge of, you know, making sure the Jersey sponsor was, was giving us our money. I was in charge of, uh, coaching the mm -hmm. coach, and all this stuff that, you know, as a 20, 25, 26 year old, I was like, I have no idea. I'm completely overwhelmed. I, I just want to coach and, um, ended up calling, uh, calling Tony Annan down at uh, Atlanta and just, you know, asking like, Hey, is that job still there? Is that job still available? Um, it wasn't at the time, but he, you know, decided to call me back about a month later when he knew that uh, a coaching position would open up. And, you know, I, I jumped at it when it, when it, when it came about to, uh, to go down to Atlanta and coach their, uh, their under 12s. So um, don't regret any, uh, <laughs> any, uh, any bit of it, but, it was, uh, yeah, kind of crazy, crazy story. If you, if you, when you come to think about it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, who would have thought just putting together some training videos and trying to yeah. help other coaches or provide value to other coaches now was, you know, that was the thing that, that kickstarted your, your journey, your career to, to the point where you are now. Incredible. Yeah, it really is incredible, Brendan. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, without Doug and, you know, without some of these, these people that, uh, have had major influences on my coaching career, I probably would still be in, um, New York coaching for, you know, the Alley Cats or New York Elite or, or one of those clubs there, or who knows, maybe even college, something like that. So yeah, crazy. <laughs> yeah. You brought up a, a really interesting point there that I, I was hoping to touch on that when you, I'm sure you experienced a little bit when you first got into Atlanta, but when you go into a higher level youth academy, um, kind of the attention to detail and the, you know, the idea of a philosophy of play, a style of play, certain game principles. Like I know when I coached at a, a club called FC Delco, it was kind of an eye opener for me to experience, um, you know, the technical directors and the directors of the club coming in and teaching all the coaches like, Hey, this is the way we want to coach. We have a, all three phases of play, both offensively and defensively. We have a certain, you know, they had a name for each one. It was like uh, in offense, it was construction, creation, completion, you know, defensively it was uh, delay, deny, disrupt. Like, so it's each phase of the game had its own very specific kind of category. You know what I mean? And, and that was kind of like mind blowing to me because <laughs> I had played at a, a decent level growing up, but I never had that level of attention to detail, you know, and it was like, wow, this is, you know, this is legit. This is the real deal. <laughs> Did you have a moment like that maybe in Atlanta where it even kind of took it to another level of attention to detail? We were like, oh, man, like this is a this is a whole new ball game. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, I had the same same experience. You know, when I came down to Land United, um, it was the same. You know, phases both attacking and defensive. And then, you know, looking at it, we we called ours. Um, you know, find the attack in the you know with possession of the ball in the in the defensive third. You know, can we find moments to go forward? Obviously, the attacking third is you know finishing and you know adjust the score and all these different principles that you had underneath it. But yeah, for me, it was like like mind boggling to, to think about because, you know, this isn't the, it wasn't the way that they taught in, uh, in my club in New York. And it wasn't, um, you know, anything that was really familiar. And it was really kind of one of those things where, 
you know, you, you, you kind of like fake it until you make it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was, uh, I was always a really good coach. I was a really demanding coach. I was really a technical focused coach. Uh, but then taking that and then kind of, you know, learning. I remember when I was, when I was down here, um, you know, the first couple of months, you know, doing so much research and just trying to catch up because I had so many talented, you know, coaches that were in the academy um, with me that, um, you know, that uh, this is what, this was like the Bible that they lived by. And, um, you know, I had, I needed to catch up quick or else I would get left behind. But yeah, it was, I had the same crazy experience, <laughs> but yeah, it was <laughs> Great. I think it's another one of those stepping stones to in uh, in my coaching career for sure. Yeah, and from some of the research that I was doing and, and some that I've read up on you about is part of maybe another stepping stone in your career was not only having the opportunity to coach at a couple of different age groups in the academy, but also um, taking part in the course with the French Football Federation. Can you speak to yeah. a little bit um, that kind of course, maybe what it's done for you, what the, even just the experience as a whole has been like? Yeah. So um, it's now, it's probably become the longest coaching course in uh, the history of coaching courses just because of COVID. So um, <laughs> yep. basically you, you get to, um, I was, I was selected to go on this course. I was the third, the third coach from, Atlanta United to, um, to get to go on it. It is, it makes you realize how little you know about football and how little you know about youth development. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you basically the, the course, the sports, the course starts in France. And for me, it started in, uh, September, 2019, uh, in Clairefontaine where it's just like the hub of where their all their youth national teams train and even their full national teams train. Um, so started there, uh, from there, we went to real salt Lake to do a case study to spend an entire week there, uh, training and then working with players, but also, you know, trying to, you know, figure out their, their methodology and how, you know, their, of how their, their teaching methods work. Uh, from there, they came to they came to Atlanta. So we spent uh, we spent one week here in Atlanta right before COVID, and um, I think it was January 2020. And then we shut down uh, for about a year and nine months uh, for COVID. And actually, I just got back on Saturday. I just got back from the fourth week, which was down in Miami at Inter Miami's uh, facility. Um, in April, we go to Kansas City, and then the coerce, the coast the course starts in France and also ends in France. So after Kansas City, we're supposed okay. to finish up and have finals week in July um, back in uh, Clairefontaine. But you know, it's uh, it, it's really interesting. It's uh, completely different than any other coaching course I've taken. And you know, I have my A youth license with U.S. Soccer. I also have my advanced national diploma from, uh, and it used to be NSCAA. I think now it's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, United Soccer Coaches, something something like that. Yeah. Uh, which is which is all great, but all of these, uh, all of those courses do not, you know, do not come even close to what this French coaching license is. <laughs> And uh, it's uh, it's it's really interesting because, you know, it's it's dealing with a new methodology and a different way of teaching um, through guided questioning and through, um, you know, different tactical situations that, you know, really just force the player to think and force the player to um, to in, enhance their knowledge of the game while at the same time working on their you know technical ability, their physical ability um, and all that stuff. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy, but it, it will be a huge relief when it's, when it's over in July. Um, but definitely longest coaching course ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you were not expecting to embark on a two year <laughs> coaching course. Um, how much, how much would you say that maybe experiencing different cultures of football and seeing how other coaches coach, not only you know, in the United States, but also now you've experienced coaches from all over the world. How much has that, how much of a benefit can that be to a coach or someone that's involved in the game? Because I know for myself as a player, it was such an eye-opening thing to go over, you know, and play in Germany for a bit or play in Denmark and for a bit and just see the way that the game can be played different, right? I think sometimes in the States, we think like this is the only way to play the game. And it, what's beautiful about the game is that 
<laughs> there's a million and one different ways to actually play football. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm I'm really fortunate. I was you know able to to watch uh, Tata Martino for for two years when he was when he was here in Atlanta, and you know he's a he's a very possession oriented um, coach. He, he's you know his his players love to dominate possession and create as many chances as, as possible. They also like to on the defensive side defensive side they like to high press. Um, so just looking at it from you know from that you know. Um, you know, microscope in a way. Uh, and then going f- to the next coach, uh, Frank DeBoer, who wasn't as successful um, at Atlanta United and, you know, the the Dutch methodology of, you know, being a little bit more compact defensively, looking for different cues of, you know, when to go and mm. uh, press pr- and uh, and then, you know, be a little bit more conservative, conservative in, in the way that they, you know, create chances and keep possession of the ball. Um, I, I think it's huge. And, you know, those two, you know, Tata Martino and Frank DeBoer, both, you know, pretty successful coaches. Tata, obviously a little bit, a little bit more, um, but com- two completely different ways of looking at, looking at the game. And I think it, you know, it definitely shapes any, any younger coach because you, you, you look at some things and you see, oh, that was really good. Like for me, I always love the way that Tata's teams pressed. Um, they were very, you know, uh, they were very energetic and, you know, put a lot of passion into the way they pressed, but, you know, they, they take a lot of risks in the way that they, they press. Whereas Frank DeBoer was a little bit, you know, a little bit, um, you know, uh, not as um, crazy about pressing higher up the pitch. So I think for a younger coach, you, you know, you take all those different things that, that those coaches do well and you kind of merge them together and then you kind of create your own coaching philosophy um, from that. But yeah, I think it's, it's huge. Like any coach needs to, needs to experience different cultures and different ways of playing the game. Um, you know, the, there's a German on our staff who, you know, really thinks that, you know, Kevin Kratz, he played in the, played in the MLS, you know, free kick mm-hmm. specialist, um, uh, unbelievable player and played in the Buddhist league, all this stuff. And, you know, he's very keen on thinking, okay, this is the way that, uh, that, um, you know, the Germans, this is the way that, that we should play. Um, and it's not always the right way, but you know, that's, that's his philosophy and what, what you feel. So yeah, it's hugely, hugely important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Couldn't agree more. And, uh, I know I mentioned to you before we jumped on that, hopefully we can talk a little bit of us soccer and future of us <laughs> soccer. Cause now, especially you being a player or being a, a cog kind of in that machine of your producing players who hopefully will go on to have first team involvement or be involved in youth national team camps or, you know, first team camps. Um, I guess, first of all, what has that experience been like to, you know, it's not necessarily the only reason that you go into coaching, but what's that experience like to, you know, see kind of the fruits of your labor come forth and have a player, you know, that maybe gets an opportunity to go and train with Atlanta United first team or, gets a call up to a youth national team camp, you know, what is that experience like for you as a coach? Yeah, there's, there's no, there's no words or anything that can describe it. Like it's, it's the best thing that you can as a, as a youth soccer coach and as a developer, it's like the, the, the top, the top of the top. Right. I mean, for, for us, you're looking at somebody like George Bello who, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't um, yep. a huge influence on his career. It was kind of a little bit, he was a little bit ahead of the age groups I was working with at the time, but just watching George's career, you know, just taking off from, you know, the very, the ver- the first few starts with the, with the first team at left back uh, to his first professional goal. And, you know, being around some of the people in the stands that were, that knew him and were literally in tears because they were so happy seeing all of his hard work, like finally, um, you know, coming to what it, what it's meant to be. Um, and then, you know, mm. for getting called up to the national team to, to playing against Mexico in the, in the, uh, the gold cup final, um, you know, a few months back, like all of these moments is there's no better reward for, for a youth coach and for a, uh, educator. Um, you know, we just being around some of these guys that, that do get called up into the, into the national team pool or, um, you know, get called up for these different ID sessions. Like it's, it's amazing. Like it's, it's great to see. And just to, you know, looking back and, you know, seeing some of these guys that, you know, when they were 11, 12 years old, like, Oh, you, you never really thought what they could possibly become. 
or you know where where their career is going to take them are they going to leave their club and get released are they going to you know go mm-hmm. through the entire club and go to college or are they going to you know go through the club and you know sign either a USL contract or a or a homegrown contract and um, at the time you you have no idea you have no clue um, but you know seeing the ones that have come up and uh, and who have been successful like there's there's no better feeling for a coach it's it, it's incredible Yeah, because I think especially for someone in your position, it must be so cool to to help a player kind of have opportunities that soccer will afford to them, maybe that they wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. You know, it's always kind of like, as you said, maybe every player won't necessarily go on to sign a homegrown deal and play with the first team, but to maybe they have a chance with the second team, as you mentioned, or maybe they get an opportunity to go to get a free college education, like what that game can do for them is something that is huge and can open so many different doors for them beyond just, you know, being in a first team Atlanta starting lineup or, or something like that. You know, obviously the George Bellows are kind of what you maybe aspire to try and get to with every player, but just what the game can do for a player, it can really change the course of their life, which is incredible. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, we have some players, some academy players that have worked so hard, not just for themselves, but also for their families. You know, you have guys who yeah. don't come from much at all, especially down here, down here in Georgia. Um, you know, we have a lot of, you know, is, you know, either Hispanic kids or, um, or kids who, who, who don't come from, from very much. And it's not just them who, you know, are, are, um, uh, getting the rewards of, you know, a professional contract is their families. And it's really, like you said, it really is life changing. Yeah. And so you're a coach that's experiencing these players day in and day out when, when you're going into work. And not only that you're seeing in the teams that you play around the country, you know, you're seeing the best talent, um, from around that this country has to offer. And obviously, as we mentioned before, you know, it seems as if every week there's a new player that's rumored to, go to a new European team or, or get a national team call up or, you know, somebody who's playing somewhere that also has a, an American passport and is thinking about yeah. trying to play for the state. So, you know, as someone who loves the national team and I've, you know, I've heard that you're a huge uh, avid national team guy as well, you know, either continue to hype up the, you know, the take that I have or talk me down from, from my take <laughs> of, I feel like your soccer is in a, you know, amazing place and it's going forward in that direction, you know, I'm, I'm picturing World Cups in our future. So, I, you know, either talk me down or tell me that I'm on the right path. I don't know. You're someone who's in it and you see it day in and day out. So you'd be much better, much well-versed uh, to answer that than, than I would. Uh, I mean, I I hope that, uh, like you said, I, I am a big U.S. Uh, men's national team fan and women's national team fan. And I think on the men's mm-hmm. side, it's, you know, the U.S., the United States is a sleeping giant. I mean, we the the amount of talent that we have coming through the ranks. I mean, we uh, we leave to go um, to Los Angeles in a week to for the big GA Cup and showcase for for the older teams through 15s and 17s. And the talent that is there is is incredible. And it's not just you know U.S. soccer scouts that are re, are there you know watching these guys. I mean, you. you We'll be able to see uh, Mexican national team scouts. We'll be able to see um, probably every scout from every German Bundesliga team will also be at this showcase as well because they're seeing now, you know, how, um, you know, all this talent that we have coming through the ranks, like it's it's real and it's uh, and it's only getting better. Um, and if you, if you even look at the younger ages from, you know, 10s to 14s, um, it's, it, it, it's just remarkable to see, you know, how much, how much ground we've made up in the terms of, uh, in, in youth development. And, uh, I, I think, I think we're gonna have a really, really bright future, um, coming up and, uh, these guys coming through the ranks are, are the real deal. And Christian Pulisic was, was the first one. Uh, Giovanni Reina is, uh, you know, kind of, you know, maybe the second one. Uh, who's, who's doing, and, you know, there's loads more, Weston McKinney and, you know, all these players. But I think in, in five years, you're going to see, um, 
50 to 100 more of those players who are, you know, playing Champions League football or, you know, playing in top some of the top leagues all around the world because it's uh, it, it's in, incredible to see. And not just not just overseas, you know, some of these players that are coming through as homegrowns with some of these MLS clubs are are the real deal. I mean, you look at yeah. Ricardo Pucci from uh, FC Dallas, he's he is the real deal. <laughs> and uh yeah, and the and these guys are are only going to get better, and I think that uh, the uh, U.S. soccer is is a really really bright future um, coming ahead. So you can hop on the train. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's a good place to be. I hundred percent, hundred percent. I agree, and I think the kind of the state of U.S. soccer now, it's kind of done two things for me, like. One, I think it's just been an incredible experience, as you mentioned, you know, to watch a, a Champions League final and to have an American be involved in that in some way, shape or form is, you know, I, it's maybe something that we dreamed about as fans years ago. I, I don't know if we ever actually thought it was going to happen, you know. Yeah. Um, but another thing I think it did for me is it it kind of showed me how much respect and props I give to players before this current era that went overseas, like to the Clint Dempsey's of the world who actually went overseas, like, because there was a time where Americans, especially American soccer players were, were kind of looked down upon. And and it was like, no, you can't, you know, you guys play football and basketball over there. You can't really hack it with us over here in the big leagues. And as you mentioned, now it's as if it's completely done a 180. And now it's like, everyone wants an American in their team because it's like, they're the, the next hot commodity, you know, they're the new tech product out in the market yeah. and everyone wants to see who's coming up through the American ranks. So it, it, it gives me a lot of, I have a lot of respect for the guys who kind of paved that way and, and maybe open some of those doors for the likes of Pulisic or Reyna to now be able to have a little bit of an easier path to, to work their way up. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's like, um, like, like I mentioned before, these, these scouts and these agents know that there's a lot of talent here. And, you know, our job is right now to, to keep them and to, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, they're, they're staying here so that, you know, hopefully there's a, um, a hefty, you know, transfer fee for when we do send somebody overseas. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's incredible to, to see where these guys, where these guys are at and the, the talent that we have. It's, it's like you said, everybody's, everybody's trying to get their, uh, their piece of the pie. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. So for all those uh, national team fans that are listening, you know, you heard it from the horse's mouth. We're, we're in a good spot. <laughs> we're going in the right direction. <laughs> <Doing> all right. <laughs> all right, Steve. Uh, thank you so much for, for taking some time out of your day to, to share your knowledge with us, share your uh, story in both playing and coaching. I hope it is something that those who are listening can take a lot of value from because I know I definitely learned a lot and took a lot of value from this. So can't thank you enough, and I and I greatly appreciate it. Definitely, and thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it. Of course, of course. Thanks again. And uh, so it's LA next week. LA next week. Yeah, we drew. We have um, San Jose Earthquakes U 17s first, uh, Philadelphia Union uh, the the game after that, and then we finish up with uh, Columbus Crew. So it'll be uh, three tough games. Uh, when I get off with you, I got to. Yeah. Uh, jump on and uh, continue to scout some of those, some of those guys. So um, yeah, all in the day's work. <laughs> I appreciate it, Brandon. Thanks so much. Well, best of luck. Yeah. Thanks so much. Definitely. Thanks again to Steve for being in the 11 with us this week and sharing his story in coaching. Hope that you guys all enjoyed it. I hope that you're still getting a lot of value out of these episodes because I know I'm enjoying them listening to these stories. I hope you guys are too. With that in mind, if you have an idea for someone who would just be perfect for the Indie 11 podcast and you want to see them on the show, comment on the Instagram post for this episode. Follow us on Instagram at Indie 11 pod and go over to that post and say, hey, I want this person on or I want you to talk about this in the next episode. I am trying to do this and I need some help. Whatever it is that you're thinking that you want to be addressed on this podcast, whether it be via a guest or whether it be just be something that I talk about, definitely go. I would encourage you to follow the Instagram and do that. And hopefully we can get the ball rolling with something like that and, and get some of the guests that you are interested in or the content that you are interested in listening to. So thank you again to Steve. 
thank you to all of you out there listening and make sure you go and follow the Instagram page and shout out who you'd like to hear next. With that being said, I'll check you on the next one. Peace. Thank you.